Hi, I'm Chen Wei Liu from Warrior Business School. My colleague David Muslush and I are in Professor Jim Mars' office. Good afternoon, Jim. Good afternoon to you. It's uh, our great pleasure to interview Jim for the uh, 50th anniversary of behavioral theory of the firm. The book is right here. So Peter Madsen, uh, Vina Desai, Dave and myself also organized a symposium at an academy meeting in Florida this year to celebrate the anniversary. And this uh, interview is in part to complement uh, the symposium. So thank you, Jane, again for supporting our initiative. Thank you. Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure for me to be able to do it. I'm sorry that I can't be in Orlando playing with the Disney folks and talking to all of you good people. But uh, at least this piece of work will demonstrate that I'm still alive. A uh, fact that surprises me as much as it probably surprises most of you. <laughs> the, uh, but it is a pleasure and thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Jim. So, as explained to Jim before, that uh, the method to determine the interview question this year is to use crowdsourcing. So, what we did is that we sent emails to the Academy of uh, Management email list and invite management academics to suggest questions they want to ask Jim most, at the same time uh, vote for the question they want to ask Jim most. And this interview is based on this voting result. So the question, we have seven sets of questions in two broad categories. And the first category is about behavioral theory of the firm in general, and the second part of the question is about doing research in general. So let's begin with the first set of the question. Jin, so can you tell us about your collaboration with Richard Syed on behavioral <laughs> theory of the firm? Well, that, that goes a few years back. So you have to trust my memory, which is probably no better than anyone else's. But uh, in 1953, I, with a fresh new PhD and at the age of 25, went to the Graduate School of Industrial Administration at the Carnegie Institute of Technology. Uh, this was an extraordinary institution. It was presided over by a dean, Lee Bach, who was then 37 years old. And the intellectual life was very much surrounded three critical people, Bill Cooper, who was then about 39, uh, Franco Moliani, who was then about 37, and Herb Simon, who was then about 35. So it was a bunch of young Turks. And I was one of the young squirts who worked with the young Turks. And the, um, it was an extraordinary group. That group, the faculty was quite small, but the faculty and students of GSIA generated something like seven or eight Nobel laureates and something about eight to ten, I forget exactly, members of the National Academies and I think five uh, people who won the scholarship award from the Academy of Management. So it was an extraordinary group. It was a group that, uh, for which intellectual life was paramount arguments, debates, and work was intense. Most people work seven days a week. Uh, the joke was the dean came down on Sunday to see who was there. And the, uh, the presumption was that work mattered. And, and the, uh, so into that, I fell into that group, became part of that group, and Dick Seyert, who was then about, I think, 32 or so, uh, and I became friends. We, uh, and we not only became friends, we became colleagues, and we started writing. So in, I think, 1955, we published a paper in the American Economic Review. In 1956, we published a paper in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. 1958, we published a paper in Econometrica and another one in Administrative Science Quarterly. These papers 
basically became the base for the uh, behavioral theory of the firm. At the same time, I was working with Herb Simon writing organizations, and both of us were publishing other papers. So it was an intense, um, very productive group, very productive period. The, um, it was a very arrogant group. We believed that we knew what the answers were and that the rest of the world was not very bright. And we had to do, fix them. And so that propelled that particular little school into a fury of intellectual academic work. Mm -hmm. Dick and I became friends, we, our families became friends, we wrote and played together. Uh, we uh, used to go over to Forbes Field. Forbes Field at that time was the uh, playing field for the Pittsburgh Pirates, who were a miserable baseball team. But after the top half of the seventh inning, if you went to Forbes Field, you could get in free. <laughs> so we would walk over there and carry on our conversations in the bleachers, overlooking the latest failure of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Now, I should add that we also lived to witness one of the great events of all time, which was the 1960 World Series, in which the Pirates defeated the New York Yankees against all odds, and which was finished in the last half of the ninth inning of the seventh game, when Bill Masaroski hit a home run over the left field wall. And that home run, Forbes Field is long gone. Well, it's where the business, the, the University of Pittsburgh Business School is now. University, the business school is located in Wright Field, which is perhaps appropriate. Uh, but a portion of the wall in left field is maintained as a monument to that victory in 1960. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were there, you would know how important it was. It was pretty important. But that's the culture, that's the climate in which Dick and I wrote. Mm. Wow, thanks Jim. I think it's fair to say that we all hope to have a research partner like him or like the research group uh, over there to have the ambition to change the world. Well, we, we knew we were going to. Yes. <laughs> So the second set of the question about re behavioral theory of the firm is about looking forward. What needs to be done about behavioral theory of the firm? And in particular, we have three questions in this set. So the first one, moving forward, what are the most important unresolved theoretical questions that the literature that's built on behavioral theory of the firm can tackle? Next, what processes identified in the behavioral theory of the firm still needs further development like search, routine, attention, and others. And the third question is that is, how is the behavioral theory of the firm related to theory of organizational evolution and adaptation? So maybe we'll learn your responses <laughs> to this question, Jim. In 25 words or less, right? <laughs> Certainly. Uh, well, let me, uh, let me set a little bit the scene. When, when we wrote this uh, book, microeconomics, had two major projects, and it's still substantially true of microeconomics. The first project was to educate people how to make intelligent choices of a particular sort, meaning a sort that calculated the probable consequences of alternatives and selected that alternative that maximized present value. Uh, that much of the discipline, much of the effort was directed to persuading people that that's the way one ought to act. The second project was trying to understand how collections of people like firms or societies and so on made decisions work. Now it's obvious that if the first project is totally successful, the second project is simply a derivative of it. And the uh, most of economic theory at that time assumed that the first project was largely successful. Therefore, that one could have a theory of the firm which was basically derived from decision theory. Mm -hmm. uh, 
our commitment was that you had to understand the actual processes, the processes that firms use, the uh, search procedures they had, the decision procedures they had, the way they learn, uh, and that if you understood those, you would in fact discover that not every firm all the time followed the rules of decision theory. Uh, we set out to do that, and to a large extent, I think we, I don't know, I don't, wouldn't say we accomplished our goal, but we were pretty consistent in trying to do that. The, uh, but most of that still remains to be done. And the, the project of understanding the process, the actual processes of firms, is still a minor part of contemporary economics mm -hmm. and uh, therefore falls more and more on students of organizations. Mm -hmm. and that, so we have a, a kind of curiosity where the most important work in economics is being done outside of economics. At least that's my picture of it. Now the, if you ask sort of what are the the critical domains. Different people would answer different things on that, but I, I would think that one is to understand adaptive processes. Mm -hmm. uh, and adaptive processes include the processes by which you filter through alternatives to find some rather than others, and the process by which new alternatives, new options are, are generated. Mm -hmm. But those we need to understand much better. Mm -hmm. The uh, a second thing that really quite different in many ways mm -hmm. is that if we are going to think of decisions as being somehow related to preferences or utility functions or whatever you want to call them, then we need to attend to understanding where preferences come from, mm -hmm. how they change, how to what extent they are endogenous to decision making and things of that sort. And the third thing that I would put on the list is to understand rules mm -hmm. and how they are developed and how they are implemented. That one of the major points of the behavioral theory of the firm is that firms followed standard operating procedures. They followed the rules. Uh, subsequently, people have done a good deal of work in identifying how that is linked to identities and how it is linked to something we call the logic of appropriateness. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to be done on rules, how they change, how they develop, and how they are uh, spread through an organization. Mm -hmm. So those are the, the, the agenda that I would uh, push on you. Mm. Now you had a third question that I'm yeah. how, forgetting. Yeah, how behavioral theory the firm relates to organizational oh, yes. evolution and adaptation. Well, well clearly it's, it's intimately related. Mm -hmm. The, the idea that firms follow rules is fundamental to at least the, the Nelson and Winter version mm -hmm. of evolutionary economics. Mm -hmm. In the Nelson and Winter version of evolutionary economics, the, the genes effectively of mm -hmm. evolution in firms are the rules. Mm -hmm. The rules are the invariant things that are passed on from one generation to another. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, a theory of evolution it would, is a theory of how rules change and develop. Mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. which the, uh, and, and more generally, I'd say that anyone who wants to understand firms, as we tried to do, has to understand selection processes, mm -hmm. and has to understand evolutionary processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Jim, for your thoughtful responses. So the third set of questions related to behavioral theory of the firm is looking backward. In particular, two questions were gain, uh, gained high votes in our survey. So the first one is, after 50 years of research, since behavioral theory of the firm, is there anything you think that has been proved incorrect in the original work? And the second one in this set is, is there anything you wish you had done differently uh, when developed behavioral theory of the firm? Well, those are really, in some sense, the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, and because in the kind of 
theorizing that involves the behavioral theory of the firm, you do not have the precise point predictions that are going to be precisely disconfirmed. So you ask sort of what was not as well developed in that theory as might have been. And there I think we were too cautious in our uh, treatment of rules, that we did not see how important the rule-based nature of human behavior was to economics. And I say that particularly because over the years, having nothing to do with behavioral theory of the firm particularly, economics has gone further and further from an understanding of behavior because it has simply not understood the importance of rules, of identities, of uh, obligations, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, what I think is essentially a failure of microeconomics, uh, is partly due to the fact that we were too cautious about pointing this out. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we were too cautious because we didn't realize it, <laughs> but uh, whatever it was. The other thing that seems to me we didn't do as well as we might have done is to develop the ideas of learning and adaptation. That we identified that they were important. We said that you had to understand learning of goals, learning of knowledge, and so on. But we did not attempt to develop theories of learning. And particularly, we did not do the kind of work that's been done more recently where one identifies the mistakes of learning. And similarly, the mistakes of evolution. As the, we suffered from, I think, a, a sense that learning was relatively efficient and evolution was relatively efficient. And we now know, of course, that they aren't particularly efficient. So uh, those two things seem to me things that we could have done better. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. Having heard that, uh, we still believe we are in the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I think it's perfectly possible to believe in the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> uh, it is a belief that will be continually um, buffeted by experience, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what experience is for. Of course. So the fourth set of question is about the current work related to behavioral theory of the firm. In particular, what recent developments in behavioral theory of the firm are you personally most excited about? Please, Jim. Well, I think it's obvious from what I said that I am most currently interested in the work on learning and adaptation, mm -hmm. uh, particularly that part of it that focuses on the possibilities that learning may lead you astray, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly on those parts that try to deal with where does novelty come from. Mm. The sources of novelty is a great mystery in evolutionary theory. It's a great, well, it's partially a mystery. Evolutionary theory has two sources of novelty. One which it understands fairly well, the genetic combinations. One of which it doesn't understand at all, which it calls mutation. Mm. And it, it's, mutation is basically a label for what you don't understand. Well. We have a similar problem. As you look at people trying to understand where novelty comes from, there are a number of people who are you, looking essentially for combinatorics of existing rules or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that is very interesting research, the John Paget's research on uh, chemical analogs of that process are very interesting. Uh, but I don't think we've unlocked the key. I don't think we have anything comparable to Mendel, and until we get to something like that, uh, we can hand wave a good deal about combinations, but we don't understand them very well. And so that would seem, seem to me that the sources of novelty are a domain that excites me and concerns me. Thanks, Jim. I hope researchers on this topic are watching this video. So the last set of question is, 
So do you think behavioral theory of the firm has influenced mainstream discipline like economics, psychology, sociology? Why do you think it has or has not? Well, Jingwei, that's a uh, question for an intellectual historian. <laughs> and I'm not an intellectual historian. I, I'm, I like sometimes to imagine I'm a, an object for their study, but not that I'm not part of them. So basically I would look at the people who've tried to study that kind of question. And Mia Auger has done some work on that. She, for example, has looked at all of the journals that reviewed behavioral theory of the firm and at the articles in those journals that cite the behavioral theory of the firm and has said, what are, the, what are the words in the titles of the articles? Right, it's a very mm -hmm. interesting idea. Mm -hmm. Well, what she finds is that the Behavioral Theory of the Firm is cited very generally for process notions. Mm -hmm. uh, and that it's cited very generally across all of these fields, but the more specific things are different for the different fields. Mm -hmm. So that uh, economics would have a, a different take on behavioral theory of the firm according to that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I've done, just for you, is I've read the very recent, there's a very new handbook of organizational economics, mm -hmm. uh, edited by uh, Bob Gibbons and Paul Milgram. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry, John Roberts, not Paul Roberts. And that's a big book. It has 28 chapters and 1181 pages, written by 45 authors. About 90% of the authors are, are economists. All right. The Syerton March book is cited on precisely eight pages of those 1181. Mm -hmm. Uh, now that that number is exceeded tenfold by people like Bengt Holmstrom or Jean Tirol mm -hmm. or uh, Paul Milgram. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it compares favorably with the numbers recorded for Joseph Schumpeter, mm -hmm. who appears on only one page of this handbook, <laughs> Ludwig von Mises, who appears on only one page. Alfred Marshall, who appears on only one page, <laughs> Gerald de Rue, who only made two pages, <laughs> Jacob Marshak, who made six pages, and Adam Smith, who made seven pages. <laughs> so it's about like Adam Smith, <laughs> if you like that kind of car. <laughs> and uh, in this whole handbook, neither John von Neumann or Oscar Morgenstern ever got any mention. March and Simon was mentioned five on five pages. So basically, if you take that handbook, contemporary economists working in the organization's field have no history. They don't. They don't cite anyone who hasn't written in the last ten years. Uh, there are some exceptions. They do cite Ronald Coase mm. on thirty-two pages. Mm -hmm. They cite Herbert Simon on 26 pages and Kenneth Arrow on 23 pages. But basically, uh, they don't do much. The Syrett March citations are focused uh, entirely on conflict and the strategic nature of information. So anything else from Syrett March you don't find. And in fact, if you look in the, the subject index, um, Bounded rationality is cited on five pages. Politics is cited on five pages. But on no page is there any mention of aspiration levels, organizational slack, or satisficing. Uh, on the other hand, incentives are mentioned on 193 pages. Property rights on 89, contracts on 81, incomplete contracts on 35, and agency theory on 68. So you can see that the thrust of the behavioral theory of the firm has not made a major impact on that corpus. Now the exception, 
might be the transaction costs mm -hmm. analysis. And that would, we'd have to talk about, uh, uh, well, if we say why, why has it or has it not s spread? Mm -hmm. And so we need a theory of diffusion. How do ideas spread? Mm -hmm. And you, uh, almost any theory of the spread of ideas talks about the carriers of ideas. Who are the disease carriers? Mm -hmm. uh, and who are they? They're students. So, um, Oliver Williamson. Mm -hmm. Oliver Williamson gets cited an awful lot in economics. He owes a lot to the behavioral theory of the firm. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he would happy, happily acknowledge that. Um, and in fact, if you go to the, back to this handbook, seven of the eight references to Sire and March or is it six or seven? Seven of the eight come in chapters co-authored by Bob Gibbons, who was once a student of mine. <laughs> so, uh, on the other hand, so it hasn't spread very much through economics. Mm -hmm. If you look at the field of strategic management, mm -hmm. it's fairly spread a fair amount through that. And there, we have quite a few students. Uh, we have people like Dan Leventhal, Henry Grave, uh, Ann Miner, uh, Willie Ocasio, Teresa Lant, Steve Mazias, Harry Lewin, Sim Sitkin, Klaus Rehrer, Mark Zibrocki, Christine Beckman. The ideas spread through students. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, there's a, when you start talking about epidemiological models of the spread of ideas, you have to be careful because ideas spread, they transform at the same time as they transfer. Mm -hmm. So, and that makes intellectual history very difficult because I don't know, you know, I read somebody and they use an idea that sounds an awful lot like an idea that I've heard of before, mm -hmm. but they label it something else. Mm -hmm. and that, that's part of the story. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the punchline is most of modern organizational economics uh, does not, is not conscious of any influence by behavioral theory of the firm. There are parts of it that have been influenced by it, but the, the history is lost in the generational change. Thank you, Jim, for uh, responding to all this question related to behavioral theory of the firm. So on behalf of um, those who are watching this video, we thank you. Thank you. So in addition to the question related to the behavioral theory of the firm, we uh, also have some questions submitted about research in, uh, doing research in general, and they gain high votes. So we thank uh, Jim again for, agree uh, for agreeing to addressing uh, this question also. And this part will be uh, asked uh, by my colleague, David Moslos. Thank you, Jim, for so much for this. The first one, first question that I have sort of relates to those of us who are in a business school or more of a junior faculty like myself or, or Chen Wei. And it's really about as business schools have a pressure to provide incremental publications, how do we go about of developing big theory as the behavioral theory of the firm? <laughs> well, David, I'm, uh, I have a little problem with the concept of big theory, and I'm not sure the behavioral theory of the firm quite fits it. But, you know, if you say Marx or Freud or uh, Darwin, I, I expect they qualify. Uh, but who qualifies in our domain? Does behavioral theory of the firm qualify? Does Herb Simon qualify? Um, I don't know. But even more than that, it seems to me that our field develops better with powerful little ideas than by trying to find some big overarching theory. Mm -hmm. That when I read the papers that are called theoretical papers in our field, the ones that aspire to big theory seem to me almost entirely empty. And I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> uh, what 
excites me in our field are little ideas that seem to be powerful and uh, you know and things that I've been associated with that seem to me very useful are things like aspiration level based decision making, uh, organizational slack, uh, competency traps. Um, these these have some dynamics and some some power behind them I think. Uh, whereas our big theories are uh, a little too close to metaphysics for me. Next question really is related as well and it's really about why do you think the behavioral view of the firm was so influential in developing theory or organizational theory? Well, again, I, I think I would prefer to leave that to the intellectual historians. But, um, and of course I have a bias that perhaps one factor was quality. That maybe the ideas were good. Now that, that's possible and of course it's counter to the way we theorize them about things. And, but the, uh, if I were speculating in a more uh, skeptical way about the theory, I would point out that a lot of the people who cite the behavioral theory of the firm were students of mine. And <laughs> so uh, they may have been corrupted by uh, that early unfortunate experience. And I, uh, but I haven't done any systematic work. I think it is, some of the ideas in the behavioral theory of the firm seem to me to have this quality of being little ideas with power mm -hmm. that, that you can use in a lot of different situations. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that's really what we seek more than anything else. Thank you, Jim. So the next question has to relate to um, having an impact in, in management practice. So which areas of research have the strongest impact on management practice and how can those be further developed? Well, David, my own impression of the development of organization studies is that the ideas that have been most influential in management did not come from people who were trying to help managers. They came from people who were trying to find interesting ideas. So when, when I talk to managers, they say they find, sometimes they say, not always, sometimes they say they find great help from the garbage can model or from exploration, exploitation, or from competency traps, they or, or uh, sampling and, uh, on failures. Those things seem to influence them. Uh, none of them came out of a desire to be influential or a desire to help management. And I, uh, I think the, I can make the case uh, that there's some good reasons why the interesting ideas in life come not from trying to solve problems, but from trying to produce beauty or produce pleasure or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I am uh, I unabashedly in a business school, I am an advocate of ideas for their own sake. You know, the, the next question really relates to sort of managerial insights and we often find that, that practitioners write their own books and how they succeeded and advance their organizations. How do you think we can, or how can we trust these accounts? <laughs> well, as you know, David, I wrote a book about the ambiguities of experience and the main lesson of that book is how easy it is to be confused by your own experience. And certainly that's true. It's very easy for managers to be confused by their own experience. And I think all of us have the experience of reading books by experienced managers and depending on our mood, laughing or throwing them across the room. <laughs> that they don't seem to hold up, they, they say contradictory things, they don't seem to move from one point to another, they seem to say general propositions that could be true or not true, you can't tell. Uh, 
But every once in a while, you find a Chester Barnard or Dale Carnegie, who was my favorite. Uh, these are people who, in fact, have a sense of something interesting. And I, my sense of managers is that we treat them like we treat students. Students say a lot of dumb things. But our job is not to laugh at them, but to try to find the interesting things that they are trying to say. And I would say that with the writings of managers. Don't, don't treat them as true, but treat them as sources of possible ideas that can be developed by you in a proper way. Well, thank you so much, Jim. We really appreciate your insights, and there's a lot to reflect on today. And on behalf of myself and Chen Wei and Peter and Vinit, OMT, and the rest of the Academy, we sincerely appreciate you giving these insights and allowing us to be part of your celebrations today. Thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure, and I hope that uh, what I have to say is not totally irrelevant, but I repeat what I think I said at the start. Uh, old people are usually very confident of what they think they know, but they usually don't know as much as they think they know. Well, thank you so much.